Uh, some of you might know that originally the plan was for me to give kind of a broad talk about the Institute and about where we are and about the, the, the struggle to change the culture, what needs to be done, what we're doing, and how we're going about doing it. But something happened exactly two weeks ago, something that we at the Institute could not ignore. Uh, three Islamic terrorists walked into the offices of uh, Charlie Hebdo and shot in cold blood 12 people. They actually called out the specific people they wanted to murder. The editor-in-chief, the specific cartoonists. They shot them for this, for drawing these cartoons. They shot them for their ideas. They shot them because these individuals had the courage to express their ideas to make their ideas public, to engage in speech, to engage in drawing, to engage in satire. Now, this was not an isolated event, and, and I'll go over some of the previous instances of what led to this, and this is not, should not have been unexpected. But it was shocking in its brutality, in the fact that they, you know, they knew exactly what they were doing and they knew exactly why they were doing it. And for us at the Ayn Rand Institute, this issue of free speech, this issue of being able to express radical, unpopular ideas, for that matter, any ideas, is crucial. It's crucial to everything that we do. But not only is this issue crucial to who we are as an institute, to the ideas that we are trying to educate the world about. This is crucial to what it means to be part of civilization, specifically to be part of Western civilization. This is not an Ayn Rand Institute issue. This is not an issue for radicals. This is not an issue for left or for right. This is an issue that goes to the core of what Western civilization is about, what Western civilization stands for. So what is Western civilization? What does it stand for? Why does free speech matter in this context? Those are important questions, which nobody, by the way, is asking, and certainly nobody's answering. Um, there's a huge disagreement about what Western civilization is. And let me say right up front, Western civilization is not about geography. Western civilization is about ideas, very specific ideas that are specifically Western. We call them Western because they come out of Western Europe. That's why they're Western. In many respects, they come out of France. Makes this all the more tragic. So what is Western civilization? Where did Western civilization come from? So in my view, Western civilization is really the product of a specific era in the history of Western Europe. And that specific era we call the Age of Enlightenment. And the Age of Enlightenment is about what idea? What is the idea central to the Age of Enlightenment? You can yell it out. Reason. The other name for the Age of Enlightenment was the Age of Reason. So the Enlightenment sets Reason is the most important idea. The thinkers of the Enlightenment understand that reason is, is the means by which human beings survive. It is the way in which we thrive. It is the essential value that we as human beings require in order to be successful. Now, this is an identification that Aristotle makes in Greece way before that, right? But for the first time, there's a whole period that embraces that idea, the first time in human history. Embraces the idea that knowledge, the source of knowledge, is our senses, is our ability to observe, to integrate, to understand, to conceptualize the reality around us. That is a huge breakthrough 
in human history. And, to, to, and for this to be part of a whole culture, and that's what the 18th century was. It was a culture that at least tried to be a culture of reason. Who was the first figure, really, of the Enlightenment? Newton, right? A scientist. And this is important because Newton is the first one, the first human being, really, to show us the power of science, to explain the world in multiple dimensions. So for the first time in human history, we can see that this is how knowledge comes about, through a specific method, a scientific method, the method of reasoning, rather than through revelation, rather than through the Pope, rather than through communi communion with some other dimension. The knowledge is possible here, and knowledge is possible for whom? For everyone. Because as human beings, we all possess this faculty of reason, this capacity to think, this capacity to use our mind. And this idea is spreading through Europe. And part of this idea, part of this idea of reason, is shrugging off what ideas? The ideas of religion. The ideas of mysticism. Part of it is the rejection. An essential part of it is the rejection of the whole way in which religion operates, both in terms of knowledge that comes to us through revelation, but also in terms of how we arbitrate disputes. Because what's going on in Europe leading up to the Age of Enlightenment? What are Europeans doing to one another? Yeah, they're killing each other. I mean, on a massive scale. It's, it's, we think wars are brutal today. <laughs> you should read about these wars. And, and they were called things like hundred year wars, right? Talk about long engagements, that's long, right? 30 year wars, Catholics killing Protestants, Protestants killing Catholics, right? All over Europe, people being slaughtered. Why? Because they disagree, because they disagree. And the only method to resolve a disagreement was what? It was force. Was force. Reason and the efficacy of reason, raising the efficacy of reason to, to, as a primary, says no, there's another way to deal with disagreement. Reason, argument, facts, discussion. And the people in the Asian land are sick of the religious intolerance of the pe period before them. They're sick of the wars, they're sick of the violence, they're sick of the killing. And they're standing up against this, and they're saying, no, enough. This is not how we deal with disagreements. This is not human. This is not what it means to be human, to kill one another over disagreements of ideas. Right? There is a method. Let's engage in this method to resolve these ideas. So the, the core of the Enlightenment is this idea of reason and the ability to express oneself, the thoughts the new discoveries, the new ideas, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them right, some of them wrong. I'm sure there was a lot of bad science. There was a lot of bad philosophy. There was a lot of bad ideas. But the idea was that you could express them, you could test them out there, you could debate them, you could discuss them, you could argue them. And that's how you engaged with one another. That was the method by which we engaged with one another. And it was wrong. It was wrong to try and impose by force your ideas on somebody else. It was wrong to kill people because you disagreed. That was barbarism, they considered. And they understood it to be. And it was crucial that that ability to exchange ideas freely, to come up with ideas, to express ideas, that had to be protected. And they understood that ideas offend. You know, there's a big, there's a big deal here, right, about, ooh, this is offensive. Yeah, <laughs> if you're Muslim, that's pretty offensive. So, was Newton offensive? Absolutely. I mean, he offended the Catholic Church. He offended everybody who believed that to explain nature, you had to have mystical revelation. He disagreed with them. I'm sure they took it personally. I'm sure they were very upset. And if he had been born a couple of centuries earlier, 
they might have actually burnt him at the stake, which they did to many scientists and many thinkers just a little bit before Newton. Think about what they did to Galileo. Didn't quite burn him at the stake, but they put him in house arrest. Many others got burnt. That's how you dealt with people who offended you. The Enlightenment is the first era in which that's not acceptable, at least not to the intellectuals. Voltaire, a key figure in the Enlightenment, still has to escape France because he fears for his life, because he challenges religion. Now, what is the, what is the culmination of the Enlightenment project? What is the, the peak, the, the pinnacle, the, 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 the creation that is most, that has survived? The yeah, the United States of America. The Declaration of Independence. The Constitution. These were men of the Enlightenment. These were men of reason. Go to the Jefferson Memorial, and you've got that beautiful quote up on the top. And I, I never memorized this stuff, but it says something like, to everything bring reason before reason, even the existence of God. Reason is the primary. That's Jefferson. That's what this country is about. It's the taking, so Newton took reason and applied it to the physical world and explained science. The founding fathers took the idea of reason and applied it to politics. How do you create a system of politics that protects what? The individual's ability to reason and act on that reason. To pursue his values as a rational animal. Right? As a rational being. To pursue the values that enable him to be happy. They even say it. They have a right to pursue happiness. A right here means an action. And speech is an action. So you as an individual, according to the founders, have a right to pursue your values, to think, to discover new ideas, to, to, to put them into action, to act on them, to speak them, to draw them. And if they offend somebody, tough. They have to deal with it. It's not your responsibility. And indeed, for the founders, I'm going to be showing cartoons to us. So. Indeed, for the founders, the one on the left, by the way, is a Danish cartoon. We'll talk about those in a minute uh, from 2005. Uh, why, you can't see them? It doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't. I don't know what they are exactly. I've never really studied them. They're cartoons. They offend people, and people died for them. That's what matters. Uh, and, you know, the specific nature of what they say. Some of them, you know, you can imagine they could offend some of them, some people. Some of them are just benign. They're just there. It doesn't matter one way or the other. So for the founders, freedom of speech, the ability to express yourself, is crucial. It's in the First Amendment, right? First Amendment to the Constitution deals with this one issue. Okay? And why is it so important to them? Because what did they do? Who did they offend? Who did the Declaration of Independence offend? Well, King George and the British, right? It was a huge offense to them. Good. Cool, right? It stood for something. Indeed, if you really think about it, is there ever a truth that doesn't offend somebody? Is there any, ever anything, something new that somebody who's bound to tradition or bound to the past is not offended by its existence? Think Uber and taxi drivers. Right. Right. They find Uber offensive. And some of them have resorted to violence, particularly in Paris. Whoops. So this idea of free speech, the idea of a right to action, to speak, to draw, to pursue your rational values and pursuit of your happiness and pursuit of your life is at the core of Western civilization because it's at the core of the Enlightenment and it's at the core of what it is that is America. It's at the core 
of what this country stands for, has always stood for. And whose responsibility is it to protect this idea of free speech? To protect your ability to exercise your freedom? It's the government, the one job the founders, the one job they give government is to protect us from those who would silence us. It's to protect us from those who would threaten us. It's to protect us from those who would kill us. Protect our right to draw that, or to draw anything, or to say anything. That's the one job of government. It's not even to have an opinion about whether that's offensive or not. Indeed, I would argue that part of the idea behind a separation of church and state is not just church and state, but in terms of ideas, the government doesn't have an opinion about what offends some people and doesn't offend other people. What ideas are right or what ideas are wrong? What science is good science? What science is bad science? What's a good educational curriculum? What's a bad educational curriculum? Government has no role in making those distinctions. All government is there to do is to protect you from engaging in those activities, right or wrong. And many ideas are wrong. Many ideas, indeed, objectively, are truly offensive. And yet people have a right to engage in those ideas. Because part of the question you have to ask yourself, or they have to ask themselves, people who object to free speech is, is at the end of the day, who gets to decide? So there are a lot of ideas out there. Some of them are true, some of them are not. Who gets to decide which are true and which are not? Who is the authority here? And remember, what is, what is government? What is, what is government? Government is a gun. Government is coercion. Government is force. Do you want the entity with a gun, the entity that is force, to make those distinctions? Newton right, scientists, why wrong? You know? No, they can't. They don't have the tools, they don't have the mechanisms, and it's incredibly dangerous because at the end of the day, they will kill off truth. They will kill off virtue. They will kill off new discoveries. They will kill human progress. Human progress dies when you give that assignment to government. And this is, again, what the founders really understood because they'd experienced it. We're just starting to experience religious persecution and, and, and silencing of people's speech. But this is part of human history. Until the founding of America, a consistent part of human history. This is how people engage with one another for thousands of years. Right? Didn't like what you say? Not bullet, but you know, arrow to the head. Right? <laughs> this is the revolution. This is why this is, and this is precious, right? This is, this, we're still young, history-wide. 200 years, that's nothing. Right? And yet, it's already slipping away because we don't even understand it. We don't understand its source. We don't understand why it's so important. It's so important because reason is so important. It's so important because it's the human mind that's so important. It's because ideas are important. Thinking is important. This is the, I mean, reason is the way in which we survive. There is no alternative. I, you know, I like to give the example of, um, you know, if you look around the audience, you can look, not bad. You know, we're all pretty, pretty pathetic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, right? We're pretty weak. I mean, really weak. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we have no fangs. We have no claws. We're pretty slow. I mean, you guys try running down a bison and biting into it. <laughs> you can't do it. And yet, I had a bison burger yesterday. Right? I, I'm, I'm here, bison's on the plate. Right? Or, or put any one of you opposite a saber-toothed tiger. And you'd be dead. And yet, last time I saw a saber-toothed tiger was in a museum. And you guys are here, and you're not just here. You're living the life. Look, look around you. This is amazing. The comfortable clothes you're wearing, the seats you're sitting on, the, the wonderful building we're in, the sound system, the technology available to us today. All all of that is a product of just one thing. Right? Just as a, as a physical species, we're pathetic. It's, it's this, it's our reason, it's our mind. It's our ability to think, to solve problems, to innovate, to discover, to communicate, to organize, to strategize. 
right? That's how we get the bison. We build weapons. We strategize about how to hunt him. We build traps. We skin him. We use the fur for clothes. None of that is trivial. Not one of you has the gene of how to do it. You have to figure it out. Now, having even got to what it takes to design one of these, right? But it's the same principle. No different. Hunting bison, making one of these, same principle. You have to use your mind. You have to innovate. You have to discover. You have to use reason. That's how we survive. And the protection of speech is the protection of thinking. It's a protection of our mind. And this is slipping away. It's slipping away in Europe fast. It's slipping away in America slow. But it is slipping away. And I'm, I'll just give you, I'm just going to hit on some highlights because we could spend all day with all the examples and all the horrible examples of this. And uh, it's depressing enough even with just a few highlights. And it's not just that people who are offended by speech, like these Islamists, it's not just that they're acting against us. It's that what we see consistently time and time again is that government, our government, is not doing its job. It's not doing what it's supposed to do, which is to protect us. So it's a double whammy. Not only are there barbarians out there who would kill us for what we say, but the entity that we created that is our servant is not doing its job in protecting us. And worse than that in Europe, in America, not yet as bad, but in Europe, worse than that. Indeed, in Europe today, it is the government that is restricting speech. Because before these jihadists walked into this office and killed these people, the French government was after them. The French government was harassing them, was taking them to court because they were violating France's hate speech codes. And these are not codes, voluntary codes or, or private codes. This is in the law. You can go to jail in France for saying certain things. And this is all over Europe. All over Europe. And you know what started it? What started it are codes against speech that all of us would find offensive. So nobody spoke, spoke up. Nobody defended them. But what was the first, at least post-World War II, because there have always been kind of speech codes in Europe, even pre-World War II, but post-World War II, what is the one idea that if expressed, you go to jail in almost every country in Europe? Holocaust denial. So Holocaust is in Germany and in France. If you're a Holocaust denier and you, you write about it or you say it, you will go to jail. Now, it's horrific to be a Holocaust denier. It's irrational and stupid and immoral and evil and so on. But you have a right to do it. And if we believe in free speech, we have to defend your right to do it. But nobody has in Europe. So they started with Holocaust denial. Well, everybody agrees with that. Nobody, nobody, nobody likes those guys. And then slowly they expand to other stuff they don't like and other stuff they don't like. And you know, in real life, slippery slopes really do exist. Not just on slides. They really do exist. And this is a great example of one of those slippery slopes. Once you violate the principle, now we just have to figure out, OK, what do we find offensive? Oh, that's offensive. We'll ban that. And Charlie Hebdo is very close to being banned in France by the French government. Not just because they insult Islam, but because they insult the Pope, and they insult the French intellectuals, and they insult anybody. So it's the French government that is the real problem in France, in my view. Not just because they wouldn't protect these guys from the Muslims, but it's because they were doing the jihadist job for them. In Sweden, last year, a painter painted a painting, a horrible painting, stupid painting, some neo-fascist thing. He put it up in a private gallery, taken to jail, tried, convicted, six months in jail for painting a painting. Sweden, paradise, right? Like the leftists consider this the ideal. So in Europe today, there is no free speech. In Europe today, there are legislated codes against hate speech. 
and you go to jail if you break them. So free speech is dead. And you know, if, if, if people took seriously that I am Charlie, just sweet Charlie, if they took that seriously in France last, you know, two weeks ago, the first thing they would have demanded was the repeal of all hate speech codes by the French government. But the contrary is happening. There's discussion of expanding those codes, of expanding censorship on a European scale. There's talk of the European Union passing a code, a hate speech code that would cover the entire union there. So we're going to restrict people's freedoms of speech. And in addition, what is the other solution, right? We're going to increase surveillance. We're going to tap your phones more. We're going to watch what you do on the internet more. We're going to put more police out into the street randomly. God forbid we should identify any particular group not to be named as the actual bad guys, right? Because that would be hate speech if we actually said who it was. So that's Europe. It's bad. It's really bad. And again, this is not the first murder. Uh, in 2004, Van Gogh, the uh, movie, movie maker who had done a documentary about Islam, was murdered in the street, knifed to death in the street by a jihadi. Uh, Ayn Hirsi Ali's life was threatened. She ultimately had to leave. What's that? Holland. Leave Holland. That's right, in Holland. Leave Holland and come to the U.S. to find refuge. So violence in the name of silencing the so-called defenders of Islam um, is not new. What about the U.S.? Well, the U.S., thanks to our founders, thanks to the drafters of the Constitution, and thanks for Madison changing his mind about the Bill of Rights, we have this protection in writing that lots of people would love to over, you know, undo, but they can't, not really. I mean, they can chip away at the edges, and they do, and they have. But, but particularly with political speech, this kind of speech, it's right there. It's in the First Amendment. They can't really get at it because it's in writing. Europe doesn't have that. So we have codes, hate speech codes on campuses, even public universities. Right? Students are not allowed to say certain things, can be penalized for saying certain things. So you're seeing it at the edges without it being government policy. It's politically incorrect to do certain things. Newspapers won't use certain words, won't publish certain images. But it's more voluntary in quotes. And the government in the U.S. has defaulted, clearly defaulted, on its one responsibility of protecting us. And I, I want to give you a few examples of this. I think the first example that really is real was 1989. This was when Solomon Rushdie uh, published a book, a novel. This is a serious novelist, right? Grew up in Pakistan, I think. Muslim heritage. Grew up in, uh, he wrote a novel in which he's critical of Islam. Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran. That's a cool title, right? Supreme leader. Not just leader, he's supreme leader. Um, Issues a fatwa, a million bucks, on the head of Solomon Rushdie. You know, you get a million bucks for killing him. And <laughs> this is not an idle threat, right? The, the Iranians are known for assassinating people all over the place. So Rushdie really went into hiding. There was a British citizen, went into hiding in Britain. Nobody said anything, not the British government. Nobody said anything. But it went further in terms of us, in terms of America. The publisher... The booksellers were all threatened, including explicitly the American publisher, the American booksellers. Now, any half-decent president would have said, you know, at the very minimum, I'm not even saying what you really should have said to the Iranians at that point, given that they'd taken our embassy in 79, that they'd killed our Marines in Beirut in 83, that they'd killed Americans throughout the 80s, put all that aside, right? This supreme leader is threatening citizens of America? At the very least, you say, you don't dare. 
You touch one hair of an American and we will crush you. But George Bush was president. So we didn't get that. But what do we get? So this is, uh, this is his response, right? However offensive the book may be. Now note, the book is offensive. He's decided. Right? He's acknowledged. He's accepted. And he's a judge. Government is not judging what's offensive and what's not. So however offensive the book may be, inciting murder and offering rewards for its perpetration are deeply offensive to the norms of civilized behavior. Two things offensive here, right? The book and threatening murder. Both offensive. They're both about the same thing, right? This is our political leadership. Right? Not, I will defend the rights of Americans to speak, to publish, to sell anything that they want. That is my job as President of the United States. No, this offensive, yeah, you Iranians, you're kind of offensive. Stop it, please. Right? Now, when you put in the context of the embassy, the Beirut bombings, the killing of Americans, then it really, you get in focus how pathetic, how appeasing, how wimpish that response really is. How much of a betrayal that is of the responsibility of government and a betrayal of the protection of free speech. That was Bush Sr., so let's skip ahead to Bush Jr. For some reason, I couldn't find an example with Clinton, but he, he does show up here in a minute, but... Uh, by the way, uh, 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 James Baker, the Secretary of State, uh, described Khomeini's call for the, for the murder of uh, Rushdie as, he's Secretary of State, right? Regrettable. <laughs> it's funny and unbelievably depressing, right? So in 2005, a Danish uh, newspaper uh, publishes 10 Cartoons of Muhammad. Uh, these are some of them. Here are some others. And why do they publish these cartoons? They publish these cartoons because they have a sense that there's self-censorship going on in Europe. Now remember, this is a year after Van Gogh is killed. But it's also, they're hearing whispers, they're hearing stories about paintings coming down in museums, sculptures going away, paintings of Muhammad, sculptures of Muhammad. Of, uh, People trying to do like children's books describing different religious leaders and nobody would draw Muhammad. They'd draw Jesus, they'll draw Moses or whatever, but they don't, won't draw Muhammad. And it's just there's this sense in Europe that everybody's self-censoring and nobody, nobody would actually stand forward. And nobody will talk about it. And they say, this is news. This is something worth investigating, revealing, bringing to the forefront. And the way they chose to bring it to the forefront is to find cartoonists brave enough to draw Muhammad and publish it and see what would happen. The goal was, the goal was to reveal to the Europe the state of free speech in Europe, the level of intimidation that people were feeling, the level of self-censorship that was going on. And initially, nothing happened. They published the cartoons in silence. But local imams in Europe were very unhappy about this. They wanted to make a statement. So they started sending these cartoons with inflammatory letters all over the Middle East. And in 2006, riots broke out all over the Middle East and, and Pakistan and, and other places. Embassies were burnt. People were murdered. They spilt into Europe. The newspaper was threatened, just like Charlie Hebdo. Fleming Rose, who was the publisher, his life was threatened. All the cartoonists were Within, I think a few years later, one of the cartoonists was attacked in his home by an a, a, a axe-wielding Muslim terrorist. He managed to escape, but imagine, right? I mean, these guys were being targeted. People were trying to kill them for drawing this. Now, this is going on everywhere. Of course, in the United States, what do the newspapers here do? Embassies are being burnt. This is a real news story, right? People are reporting. Embassies being burnt because of cartoons, which we're not going to show you. Right? We're not going to show you. And one of the reasons we're not going to show you is we're not convinced that our government would protect us 
if we did. Because this is what Bush had to say about the cartoons, right? George Bush, President of the United States of America, the cowboy, the tough guy. I hate Bush. I'm just out there. You can ask me in the Q&A why, but I really, really deeply hate him in a way that I don't hate many. He says we find them offensive about the cartoons, and we certainly understand. I mean, he's, he's taking his father one step more, right? We certainly understand why Muslims would find these images offensive. The State Department says anti-Muslim images are as unacceptable as anti-Semitic images, as anti-Christian images, anti-Christian images which are often funded with taxpayer money in the U.S., by the way, right? Just to give the contrast. Or any other religious beliefs. So offending religion is unacceptable, something, by the way, the Pope said last week. He would. But the State Department, again, remember where the Enlightenment comes from, where this whole idea of free speech comes from. It comes from shrugging off religion. It comes from a period where they offended religion because they were letting go of religion. And yet today, our politicians want to protect religion. A few years after the cartoons were published, Bill Clinton, had to bring him in, uh, said, none of us are totally free of stereotypes about people of different races, different ethnic groups, and different religions. There was this appalling example in Denmark, these totally outrageous cartoons against them, against Islam. So we get no government protection, no assertion of free speech, no assertion of the right to express yourself, nothing from our political leaders, from the freest country in the world. Blame the Europeans. And President Obama. Remember Benghazi? And put aside the, the lies and that part, but let, let's take, take it for what it was, right? So Benghazi happens, and what does the Obama administration blame it on? A video on YouTube. Let's pretend that that were true, right? It doesn't matter. Even if it was true, right? what should have been the response? You know, should have been to protect the right of, that, of whoever produced the video, to produce the video, to stand up for his right to free speech, to tell the Muslims that that is unacceptable, to do militarily what you need to do to penalize them, but that Americans will express themselves. That should have been the response. What was the response? A phone call from Jay Carney, press secretary to the president, to Google, asking that they take the video down. Remember, government, guns, force, coercion. The press secretary of the president of the United States doesn't just ask. So, you know, and this guy was, whoever made the video was later persecuted for all kinds of other stuff, but, you know, this is, has a lot to do with it. So rather than defend his freedom, they go after it. They just try to destroy him. You can see that even in the United States of America, our freedom of speech is being eroded. Today, there's a cartoonist in Seattle who, uh, who uh, declared that everyone draw Muhammad Day. Right? And she's in hiding. She fears for her life. And nobody's protecting her. And she's been in hiding since 2010. Five years now. For what? Um, so we're at a point today where we can't trust our government. Here's a, I mean, this is my, I, I think the one that creeps me out the most. So you remember Terry Jones, this, uh, uh, um, this guy who wanted to burn Korans in Florida, right? I mean, it's stupid. Whatever, I mean, he, he, he's, not a very, he's not the smartest guy and he's not the best person, but he wanted to burn Korans, right? So this is, so this is what Obama had to say, right? It, it's, I mean, listen to how he says this, because he's, it's like he wants to stop the guy. I mean, this is, this is what I said about it's written in black and white, so they can't do it, but they want to, right? He wants to stop this guy, but he doesn't have the tools to do it. Right? So let me just find this quote. Or well, maybe not. Anyway, what he says is, 
Oh, here it is. He's kind of, he, can, he says, it's frustrating, right? And this was in an interview. My understanding is that, that he can be cited for public burning. But that's the extent of the laws that we have available to us. Wow. Now that's this close to fascism, right? Just, just if, if only they'd pass more laws, right? That I could get this guy, stop him from burning Qurans. And it, again, it doesn't matter what he's burning. It's none of anybody's business. None of anybody, unless they, somebody else's property. So what we're seeing in America today is a massive erosion in a view of what free speech is, the role of government vis-a-vis -vis free speech. And because government doesn't seem to be leading on the restraining speech, we're doing it to ourselves. We're doing it on campuses. We're doing it voluntarily. We're silencing ourselves. We're censoring ourselves. You know, government would love to do it for us. But we still have a semblance of protection of rights, and that's not happening. So free speech is in trouble. You know, it's, 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 it's in grave danger in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, but it's bad here as well. And the question ultimately is what do we do about it? Right? What can we do? Because we're not going to be saved by our political leaders. Our political leaders have shown, both right and left, Republican and Democrat, they've shown that they have no respect for free speech. They don't understand what free speech is. And they're not going to be there to defend us. They're not going to be there to protect us. They've abandoned us. They've given up on the real principles on which this country is founded. They've given up any kind of understanding of what the Constitution and what the Declaration of Independence really mean in this country. So what's left for us to do? Well, I think what's left to us to do is stand up, is speak, is object, is draw, is write, is publish. You know, prove to the world that we're not going to cower that we're not going to be silent, so we won't self-censor us. If the government wants to censor us, let them show up with guns. Let them take us kicking and screaming. Right? I love this. And Bosch is here who drew it. Bosch is right there. Um, you know, stay quiet, you'll be okay. That's a message we're getting from the world of the jihadists. Right? And it's up to us to decide, are we willing to stay quiet in the face of that? Granted, granted, that we cannot count on our government to help us. I say we not stay quiet. That we publish the cartoons at every opportunity. That so many of us do it that they can't target any one of us because they wouldn't know who to start with. We should not buy the New York Times until they publish the cartoons. I wish we had enough of us to boycott the New York Times. But my guess is nobody here reads it anyway. Um, <laughs> How about the Wall Street Journal? How many of you read the Wall Street Journal? I, knew, I read the New York Times, too. How many of you read the Wall Street Journal? Right? A lot of you. They haven't published the cartoons. Right? We need to demand that they do that. And if they all do that, again, where's the target? Who are we going to go after? And it shows strength. It shows that we believe in something. It shows that we're not going to just cower to the bastards. We're not just going to give in to fear and intimidation by barbarians who live in caves. Because that's what they are. And if we won't use the mightiest military force in human history to destroy them, then at least those of us who have the courage stand up and say, no, we won't give in. And we have to educate Americans about this, about the, the, the very foundational, the essential nature of what free speech, because what happens when we don't have free speech? So let's say, you know, I'm an objectivist. I want to I convince people out there in the world that freedom's a good thing, that Ayn Rand's ideas are the right ideas. If I can't do that by speaking, what is the only other mechanism left for me to advocate for freedom? Guns. 
revolution. I fear I lose that one. They have bigger guns. I don't want to get to that point, but that's, that's what Ayn Rand actually said. When is it time for a revolution? And a key time for a revolution is when you can't speak, when you can't use reason, when it's not permissible to engage in reason, discussion, in argument, in persuasion, in an attempt to convince. And then all you've got is a gun to fight for your own freedom. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. So if we want to change the world, if we want to change any little piece of the world, if we want to just live a better life, this is what we have to fight for. This is the idea that is crucial for us to continue to execute on all the other ideas. We want capitalism, great. If we don't have free speech, we won't get it. We want romantic arts, great. If we don't have free speech, we won't get it. Every other value that we want to fight for, the means to get there is through speech, is through reasoning, is through using our mind in argument with other people, trying to convince. So if we're going to stand for anything, if we're going to stake our lives on anything, right, this is the idea that we should stake it on. The right to think, the right to live, is the right to speak. Thank you all. So we've got a mic. I'll take questions. I'm not your first question, Ron. Yeah, I know. Somebody has to be the first, and then it kind of usually rolls. <laughs> Count the mic as we're filming, so that way we can capture the question. I just wanted to know, what was that last sentence you said? The right to speak? I don't know. I made it up the on the right spot. The right to live? <laughs> the right to I think speak. it was the right to think. The right to live is the right to speak. I mean, it's all the right to life. It's all derivatives of the right to life. So could you comment, you touched on it, but comment on the kinds of responses that have come from what's known as the right to these events? Yeah, I mean, the right, the right is mostly silent. I mean, you don't see much responses, certainly not fundamental responses. So the right wants to talk about Islam. The right wants to talk about terrorism. The right wants to talk about what do we do with these radicals, right? That's what it wants to talk about. It doesn't want to talk about free speech. I mean, there's very little conversation about what free speech means, about what the right to free speech means, about the role of government in the context of free speech. That's all you hear is about what we should be doing and no-go zones in, in this and that. It's all practical stuff about the enemy, but not about the principle because they don't conceive of the principle. They don't understand the principle, and they would love to violate it when they had the opportunity to do it for their ideas. Right? And they have a problem. You see, they would love, they would love, most of these guys would love to ban, I don't know what it is, Jesus on the urinal or whatever the thing. They would love to ban that stuff. They're just looking for an opportunity to do it. Right? So they are against defending Islam. They're against the cartoons. They're also against violence, so they, they have to condemn the terrorists. But... They're against the, 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 just like the Pope said. Well, what did the Pope say? You know, violence is inexcusable, but nobody has the right to offend religion. Religion. You can offend Iran. You can offend capitalism. You can offend anybody here. You just can't offend religion. And what's interesting is, somebody should ask me, why is it so, why do they make an exception for Islam, right? Because we agree that you can offend everybody else, but not Islam. So somebody asked me why you can't offend Islam. But if you want to, if you don't, that's fine. Um, so the right has no response. I mean, how many, how many people have you seen out on television talking about, really talking about free speech and what it means and what the implications are? You don't see it. I mean, uh, they, they give, the best of them give tough speeches about the need to deal with the jihadis, with radicals, with whatever, you know, that's the best you'll get. But, but nothing principled. Hi. Um, I'm in academia, and I see the free speech zones shrinking a lot oh, yeah. on the places where we're supposed to have ideas. Can you speak to that and 
any ideas of what, like, I'm afraid to even use, I'm tenured, so I feel I have a little more freedom to teach things, and I do teach Ayn Rand, but it's still scary. So I was, I was at a public school in, um, in San Jose, Tuesday, I think, yesterday, it was yesterday, yesterday morning, and the, it's speaking at an English class, an AP English class, and the, the teacher told me afterwards, he said, you know, if I taught, if I suggested teaching to the class, Huckleberry Finn, I would be sent to sensitivity training. Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain, right? That's how bad it is. You can't mention Mark Twain in America. So the free speech zones are shrinking, which is horrific, particularly in public, public schools, particularly in universities, which claim to be what? Intellectual, knowledge, seeking the truth. Well, if you're seeking the truth, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of speech? Bad ideas? Well, if you're seeking the truth, then you could contradict bad ideas. That's easy. Right? What are they afraid of? They're afraid of the truth, yes. And remember, you know, the right to free speech is the right to offend. If we all agree we don't need a right. We just agree. Right? We don't need rights as a protection. Right? We don't need protection if we all agree. It's when we don't agree. It's when we don't agree in a major way is when we need to be protected by a right. It's the right to offend. There's no difference. You can't say, I, I saw this a lot on Twitter and on, on, on Facebook. Yeah, but you know, you really shouldn't offend. You shouldn't. Well, but. Again, every truth, every truth offends somebody. I mean, it's, it, the standard of not offending is a standard which means not speaking, not seeking truth, not innovating, not doing anything new, not doing anything different than what's been done before. It's, the, it's a preservation of the status quo. And that's what universities are about. They, they, they're about the preservation of that mainstream, you know, leftist agenda of the university. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be questioned. They want to control. They, have the, they believe they have the truth in some bizarre way. They want to control you. And they don't want, to be, they don't want to, the, the discussion, the argument, which way they would lose. So it's authoritarian. It's horrific. And it's so horrific because it's a university, a place of learning, of all the places that should not have right, uh, uh, hate speech codes. The universities are the primary place. You shouldn't have them. The opposite. You should be encouraged to express yourself. And say stupid things. You're young, right? Students are young. They're going to say stupid things. We all said stupid things when we were young. That's part of learning. But when you discourage that, when you oppress that, when you destroy that, you destroy thinking. I'm not going to think certain directions if I can't express myself in those directions. So you shut down whole areas of thought. And that's political correctness, right? That's the whole agenda of the political correctness crowd. And at the end of the day, this is postmodernism. This is the consequence of this whole postmodernist, subjectivist world out there. Right? Because what do the postmodernists tell us? There, there is no truth, right? There is no truth. So what does that negate? If you say there's no truth, what do you negate? The ability to do what? To argue, to discuss, to, to, to have a, you know, you, you can't point to anything. No, no, look, it's like this. There is no this. It's all flux. It's all moving. There's no it, it, right? What did Clinton say? What is, is? No, well, Clinton was the first postmodernist president. I, I truly believe he believes. Hey, what, is, what is, is? I don't know. You know. My professor told me it's all flux. It's all, he went to Yale. That's why. Better the school, the more nutty it is. So. If, if it's all in flux, if there is no truth, if there is no reality, if there is no something we can point to when we're discussing, he was actually first. If there is no something we can discuss, then once they get into power, the only way to institutionalize their ideas is by doing what? By forcing you to accept them. They can't argue with you. They can't explain it to you because explanation requires a reality, and postmodernism tells you there is no reality. 
See, it undercuts everything. It undercuts reason, and therefore it undercuts everything. So the only thing, once you undercut reason, this is the principle, this is the fundamental. Once you undercut reason, all you have is force. And this is why religion almost always leads to force. Because religion is the undercutting of reason. It's a negation of reason. It's mystical revelation. I got this revelation. Oh, no, no, no. I got a different revelation. Let's argue about it. How? By what standard? The only standard is whose God's going to be on my sword or on your sword? Who's going to be stronger? That's the only way to resolve religious disputes. Because they're not about reality. They're not about fact. So religion has to lead to violence. Some religions have been, that's being toned down because reason has been introduced into those religions, Judaism, Christianity, post-enlightenment. Not Reformation, post-enlightenment. In Islam, that hasn't happened. It's still pure mystical revelation, and therefore it's all about a sword. It's all about force. Uh, I, I'm an objectivist into to kind of help you light a fire under this and make it concrete for everyone. What do you think of the concept or idea that America is already socialist? I mean, I think it's, I think it's a mistake to call America socialist. Uh, as somebody who grew up in a socialist country, I can tell you. We're not quite there yet. And it's not the direction I happen to think the country's moving in. I don't think we're becoming more socialist. Socialist means the state owns the means of production and, and state ownership of. And we're more sophisticated than that. It's not state-owned. Oh, no. It's not. But what is it? <laughs> they got screwed. Yeah. But that's not socialism. Let's get, just get our terms right. Is it right? fascism? This is fascism. Okay. It's a different form of statism. It's where the government doesn't, control, doesn't own the means of production. The government controls the means of production through regulations, through screwing the bondholders, through putting people on the boards of directors, or through putting, enforcing companies to put certain types of people on the board of directors, through all the different mechanisms of the regulatory state. We have a regulatory state in the United States. Right? And that regulatory state is, is a type of fascism. Now, it doesn't matter. You want to call it socialism, fine. Who cares? Right? But, but it's statism. This is the elevation of the state above the individual. That's the fundamental. It's that the state is all important and controls your behavior. It doesn't lead to communism. It doesn't. No. It could lead to concentration camps. There are lots of things, lots of things that could happen. There's not one form of evil, communism. Unfortunately, there are many, many, many forms of evil. Only one form of good, but many, many forms of evil. And to label it communism makes us look, it makes us look not credible. Because Obama is not, not nowhere near a communist. In some ways, he's worse than a communist in my view. He's closer to being a nihilist, which in my view is worse than a communist. He's not a communist. He doesn't believe everything should be owned by the state and everything should be controlled by the state in that sense. I don't think he cares. What he really wants is to see people destroyed. That's nihilism and it's worse than communism. Communism had this utopian vision for happy people one day. I know the reality of communism is the destruction, but that's not what he's about. It's not his ideology. And when we confuse that ideology, when we call Obama a communist, it makes us look uneducated. We don't understand what communism is. It's not good. We need to be precise in how we use these terms. Communism means a certain ideology. And that certain ideology is not the ideology that, that Obama or Elizabeth Warren hold. They hold a different ideology, in some ways worse than communism. Let's call it what it is. Now, I know. Amer it's nice to call things communism in America because we all hate it. Even, even leftist Americans don't want to be communist. But it's not accurate, and it, and it makes us, it doesn't, it doesn't legitimize our cause. <laughs> yep. By the way, if anybody wants to hear more of this kind of speech and truth on the radio, XM Sirius every day, Andrew Wilkow, it's constitutional or it's not. And there's no argument. If it's not in the constitutional, then it's a bunch of crap. Now, uh, something coming up that I my well, what makes that true? I mean, it's the you know I've argued with uh, Wilcox. I mean, the Constitution is flawed. I've heard you on the show. Right, the Constitution is flawed. The Constitution is not the Ten Commandments brought down from God. 
I mean, I'm, a, I'm all for the Constitution. I love the Constitution. I love the, I, I love the Declaration much more than the Constitution, but I, I love those documents. But they're not, they're not sacred stones. We have to understand why they're written, what are the ideas behind them, and where they're wrong. And the Constitution is wrong in some places. And it could be stronger, and it needs to be adjusted, it needs to be refined, it needs to be made better. So let's not worship a document. Let's not make the same mistake as the mystics make. But let's protect it, our Bill of Rights. Absolutely, let's protect it, but let's understand it first. And yeah. let's understand what it means, and let's understand where it comes from, and let's understand the enlightenment. That's what you need to understand, yeah. those ideas. And as far ideas. as our freedom of speech, uh, this administration and the FCC are planning to control that internet and that's coming up real soon where they plan to take that control for our own good well everything they do everything that's done in the, yes. name of the state is yes. always done in our own good but, but yes i think the internet is is the real battle is going to be a big battle for freedom of speech and 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 the airwaves and the airwaves are going to be i mean yes. they forever wanted to give equal opportunity on the airwaves because the airwaves are dominated by you know, relatively and it's, right. And it's going to be up to us to speak up because our House of Representatives, is, they're playing with deflated balls. Absolutely. And so we must stand up and speak up and, and get ready to start uh, calling uh, our Deflated brains, I think you meant. Pardon me? Deflated brains, you meant. <laughs> well, that too, but the other yeah. is more topical today. Yeah, I know. But anyway, I know. thank you, Yuri. Sure. Hey, um, I've noticed that um, people uh, like, Bill Maher, he's liberal, but he's against Islam. The main roadblock he runs into is sort of multiculturalism and anti-Western yeah. sentiment. I was wondering if you had any uh, tips on appealing to people who are, you know, who might be amenable to being pro-free speech, but are sort of... Yeah, this is a great issue to appeal to the left on, to the rational left. The fact is that reason is a concept that the left has always embraced. That the left is always, they, they've been pro-science, they've been pro-reason, supposedly. Now, the modern left undercuts those. But there's still many on the left. I mean, Charlie Hebdo is not conservative, <laughs> right? These are leftists. These are French leftists, right? The conservatives wouldn't do that. Um, so many people on the left still have a respect for free speech that people on the right often don't. So this actually, for, for us objectivists, this is a great issue that we can appeal to the left and then expand. If you believe in free speech, what about other freedoms, right? We can expand our reach to the left side. But remember, the left traditionally, the old left, the really old left, was pro-science, was, 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 was believed that if you were going to argue for you had to use reason to argue for it. Now, they failed because you can't actually argue for it using reason, but that's what they believe. The new left, and this is why I think Obama's not a socialist, the new left doesn't believe in reason. They're much more motivated by hatred and by nihilism than they are by some utopian future, socialist, beautiful world. You know, we know it's not beautiful, but they, you know, that they wrote about. So, but you've got to find the better elements of on both sides and, and cultivate them. And I think free speech is a good issue to kind of wedge issue into the left. Any ways in particular of appealing to free speech and examples? Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the cartoons are a great example. I think a lot, of, a lot of the cartoonists in America who've done all kind of satire, all kind of stuff, are offended by what happened in, or horrified, not offended, horrified by what happened in France, horrified by the fact that they might be killed for drawing something. And I think one can appeal to them. Now, not all of them, but to the better ones. They understand it. Many of them are in the arts. So if you're in the arts, you're about expressing ideas. That's what you're, what's what you're doing. And the idea that somebody's going to come and limit that or that your life might be at risk if you say the wrong thing, I think you can, I think you can talk to them about that. You know, these are the kind of issues that they would, that they would get. Thank you. Sure. Something I find interesting is a lot of the same voices who say you shouldn't paint Islam, with a, shouldn't condemn an entire religion for the actions of a few quote-unquote extremists are some of the same voices who will tell you that one hurricane or one hot day is ind indicative of uh, cli man-made climate change. That kind of leads me into my uh, area, okay. <laughs> an area where I see a, a big, huge assault on free speech, and that's this issue of man-made climate change. 
You see it being pushed by the intelligentsia and academia, the media. Yeah, I mean, and I call them posers to knowledge and science. It's, it's the and fact that they used intimidation, the whole idea of the consensus, right? 98% or whatever the number is of scientists agree with this, which is a made up number. Th that kind of intimidation to silence you, oh, you're a denier, I'm not even gonna talk to you. You see that all the time. And it's those kind of tactics are definitely tactics that are meant to silence, that are meant to, 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 to deny you the ability to speak and to express yourself. And you see that all over the place. You and you don't just see it with climate change. Climate change is one of the issues that they discuss, but it's, you see it across the left, Again, the, 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 particularly the radical left is very good at this kind of stuff, and, and the right is good when it comes to things like religion. Yeah. Thank you. They, they, they find ways to shut you up, right? And, and they often use intimidation, subtle or explicit, but it's intimidation nonetheless. Uh, why not call them Iranian and Saudi-funded terrorists? Why not name states? <laughs> why not name the states? Yeah. I, I'm okay with that. I've been naming the states since September 12, 2001, right? Um, absolutely. They're funded by those two countries, and until you deal with those two countries, nothing will change. I mean, read Winning the Unwinnable War. That's what it's all about. And um, it, it, it's absolutely that. There, there is no such thing as just terrorism out there. They're funded by the Saudis and Iranians. And by the way, Saudis, best friends, right? Our best friends. A month after 9-11, George Bush, your George Bush was hugging the Prince of Saudi Arabia. I mean, these are, these are, these are our friends, right? Um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, where did ISIS come from? I mean, suddenly out of nowhere, there's this massive military group that's marching through Iran, and everybody on the news, oh my God, where did they come from? This is an amazing. This is the Syrian opposition that the Saudis have been funding for well over a year now, that, um, that uh, many in America, on the right, wanted us to fund and supply weapons and training to, right? That uh, the Qataris, the whole, that, that whole region has been pouring money into in order to get rid of a Shiite, not really a Shiite, kind of an Alawite, which is kind of a sect of Shiism, you know, who runs Syria, right? It's all this battle between Sunnis and Shiites and, and you know, this vision of, 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 a, of, a, of, of Sharia imposed. Right? Saudis created ISIS. They're building a wall now to protect themselves from their own creation, right? Because they're afraid. Now, they're not afraid because of the religious things that they would impose on the Saudis. They already have all that. They already behead people. They already lash people. They already do all that, stone people to death. They do all the stuff ISIS does. What they're worried about is to lose their kingdom. They're worried about losing their crown. They're worried about losing the opportunity to go to Monte Carlo and sleep around and gamble. That's what they're worried about. That's what the Saud family is building the wall to protect. The Saud family. Right? Not to protect the religion, because the religion is already there. It's already institutionalized into Saudi Arabia. Right? So it's Saudi Arabia and, and the Iranians who are supporting the other side of the Syrian dispute. I mean, my solution to Syria granted that we don't have a foreign policy, is that let them kill each other. This is great. You know? Support the continued you know, uprising in Syria. Let them be so worried about each other that they don't have time for us. And when the winner is declared, crush them. <laughs> you know? that's, that's when America should intervene. But up until that point, leave them alone. Um, so it, it's clearly those two countries. Uh, Iran used to have a line item on their budget called terrorism with a budget number. But they were sued in America. They were sued here by uh, victims of terrorism attacks. So they've taken the line item out of their budget. Right? This is the kind of stuff that's going on in the world that we're negotiating with them. We're sitting down at the table and saying, hey, kind of would you behave and stop building nuclear weapons, please? And this, is, this reason would work with them. So, but look, if after 9-11, if after 3,000 Americans died and an attempt was made to kill 40,000 Americans, because if those towers had come down just a few minutes later, 40,000 could have died, right? If that didn't wake us up, <laughs> if that didn't cause the President of the United States to say the enemy is Saudi Arabia and Iran, then now nobody, nobody, nobody gets it, nobody Nobody's going to do anything about it, right? 
what recommendations would you give to uh, media organizations in the U.S. that may be hesitant to um, publish controversial ideas or cartoons and speech um, because they may be trying to protect their property and their because they're afraid and their employees. Yeah. So if it's real fear, which I don't think is, is the real motive, I don't think it's most. So first of all, if it's really fear, then I understand it, right? They should be afraid. And they should be demanding the government protect them, which is the role of the government. But this is where collusion would be great, right? Antitrust collusion. All the newspapers should get together and agree to publish the cartoons together. Make a statement. So imagine if 50 newspapers around the country all published the cartoons at the same time. I mean, what a statement that would make. We are standing up to this. We will not be coward. And again, there's, there's, there's real safety in numbers. There really is safety in numbers. Because what do they, attack the whole United States if we all publish the cartoons? So that's what I would suggest. But at the end of the day, the demand that we have to make to our government, to our politicians, is protect us. That's your job. And if not, we'll fire you. That, that's what elections are for. Fire people who don't do their jobs in politics no matter what political party they're part of. So what's your analysis of why you think the, uh, our press is unwilling to um, take on or you know, call Islam out for what it is or why they kowtow to the... So somebody asked a question I asked to be asked, right? Exactly. That's what I'm here for. So why do we treat, why do we treat Islam differently, right? Because, I mean, cartoons are being drawn every day of, of Jesus. They depict Jesus in horrible positions, and, you know, everybody's being insulted, left and right by cartoonists, by, take South Park, right? You all know the South Park? South Park insults everybody, everybody. It's their modus operandi. Of course, South Park wanted to draw, and they did draw Muhammad, and they had him in a scene. It was a, it, one of the best episodes ever. You, if, you, if you haven't watched this, it's a Danish cartoons episode of South Park. You know, the town doesn't know what to do about the Danish cartoons, so they, take, they, so they all decide together to bury their heads in the sand. And they literally have trucks of sand brought in, and they dig holes, and everybody buries their head in the sand. It's beautiful. I mean, that's so true and so sad. But it's what we all do. We just don't do it literally. But in the episode, there was supposed to be a cartoon of Muhammad, and the Comedy, Cha uh, Comedy Central wouldn't let them show it. So they blanked it out. So they had Muhammad behind right, a screen. They, they hit him. Um, so why, why do we treat Muslims differently? And, and so I think there are a lot of reasons. But, 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 but the main reason, I think, is the, is the moral code of altruism. Altruism demands that we show respect, that we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of whom? The weak. The pathetic. Those who don't have anything. Those who are struggling. Those who are in distress. Our moral obligation is to treat them with respect. Our moral obligation is to sacrifice for them. It's to, and of all the people out there right now who's being killed left and right and suffering and poor. I mean, the poorest region in the world is the Middle East. Or close to it, sub-Saharan Africa. The pockets that might be poor. But it's the same, same thing. These are the poor of the world. These are the pathetic. These are the miserable. You can't stand up to them. That would be immoral. So there are two sides of this. So one is, the, is that. And, I, and I'll, give you, I'll give you a great example of this from this, that region of the world. What was Europe's attitude to Israel pre-1967? They loved Israel. They loved Israel. All the weapons Israel had when it fought the Six-Day War in 67 were European. They mirage planes, British tanks, German weaponry. Indeed, Americans don't know this, but from 1948 until 1967, there was an arms embargo in the United States on Israel. Not a single weapon was sold to Israel. Right. Placed there by, by uh, the um, Truman administration. Thank you. So, they love, so why did they love Israel? Underdog is such a nice way of saying it. Right. right in football, you back the underdog. No, these were pathetic, miserable, 
poor Jews who had just been slaughtered in the Holocaust and they were in a God-forsaken country in the desert and they were pathetic. So we love them. And what happened in, six, in the Six-Day War? These pathetic Jews turned out to be strong, capable, able. They beat five Arab armies in six days, wiped them out. Now we hate them. <laughs> because they're successful. Because they're proud. Because they're able. This is altruism. So Europe immediately, France, embargo of arms on Israel. We hate Israel, right? And who did they start loving? Well, they looked around the world, or that region, and said, who's pathetic? Who's really miserable? Who's suffering? Ah, Palestinians. Great, we now love Palestinians, hate Israelis. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, it happened on a day. On the day the Six-Day War ended, everything flipped. Because you can't support strength. There's no morality in pride and strength and in self-assertion. That's deemed the same morality of altruism says... You have to sacrifice for the poor. You have to respect them. You have to be good to them. You have to do all this stuff. And at the same time, what do you, how do you treat, how do you treat self-assertion and pride and power and strength? Ooh, suspicious. We don't like them. That's too self-interested. So this is the this is morality playing out on a global scale. And if you mix that up with religion, wow, powerful, powerful stuff. So we, don't, we can't be self-assertive. We can't be strong because that's wrong. We can't condemn somebody who's weak because that's wrong. So here we are, appeasing, killing our own kids, right, to bring them democracy. So God forbid we shouldn't kill any of their civilians, right? 5,000, this is why I hate Bush, right? 5,000 Americans. Young kids, your kids, my kids, died in Iraq under rules of engagement that, ugh, right? That basically, they were sacrificial animals. I mean, if we lived in a semi-rational world, George Bush would be tried for crimes against those kids. I mean, if you've ever served in the Army, you know what that is, going into a danger zone, and your hands are tied behind your back, and this is how your government is sending you there? With your arms tied around behind your back? That is pathetic. So, no, no. You go, I know, I know you hate, you so hate, you're so blinded by hatred of Obama, you can't see the truth. There was nothing worse in terms of American fighting than what we did under George W. Bush. Nothing. Now, Obama's worse, I grant that. But at least we're not going to war. You know, if you're going to tie people's arms behind their back, if you're going to take Marines and put blindfolds on them, at least keep them home. <laughs> but to go and engage in a war and do that to our kids is a crime. And nobody should ever forgive him just because there's a worse president now. It's a crime. He went to war and he sacrificed our children. That's what he did. No, they're just as bad as they were. And by the way, by the way, this is true. This is true of Petraeus. This is true of the entire military leadership. This is what they advocated for. This is the kind of war they wanted fought. If they're worse today, it's because of people like Petraeus, generals like Petraeus, that the right adores. These are people who 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 believe that the life of an American soldier is worth less than an Iraqi civilian. And that is insane. And that is suicide as a nation. And we have to recognize that and call that and call them on it, even if it's worse today. At least they're not dying by the thousands today. Right? I'd rather be out of those places, given the rules of engagement, than in those places with those rules of engagement. And I was for the wars and stuff, but not that way, not the way they were fought. Yeah, you crush the enemy. You've given a whole speech about free speech, but I find it interesting that you didn't talk about the subject of Sony and the interview, which was yeah. just a month ago, and I was wondering what your thoughts were Yeah, no, that. absolutely. I, you know, when I remember, I include that in. Um, <laughs> it's a problem of, of, of not writing out your speech. You don't include everything. Um, Sony's a great example of this, right? Uh, Sony was intimidated. 
right? It was intimidated by foreign power. Now it turns out, and I haven't read in detail about this, that the United States, the NSA, probably knew that the North Koreans were doing this when they were doing it, because they had, you know, they were bugging the North Korean servers, and they could tell that they were doing it, right? And they didn't stop it, or they didn't let Sony know about it. But they certainly didn't protect Sony. I mean, Obama said a few things about you can't silence us, and Sony should have done this. But people said that when Sony called the White House, they were not given any protection. They were not given any assurances. And again, the first response of Sony was to do what? Self-censor. Now, luckily, that passed. But that was their first response. So yes, yeah, Sony belongs in this. And there were a lot of examples. I mean, I didn't get into Citizens United, and I didn't get, there were a lot of issues of free speech out there that are very related, where we're seeing you know, speech being curtailed or attempts. And, and let me just let me say this. For the first time, as far as I know, in American history, there are debates today on American campuses, debates between legal scholars about whether free speech is a good thing or not. I'm serious. There are whole essays now published in legal journals where respected legal scholars are saying, eh, maybe this free speech is a little bit too much. Maybe we need to start curtailing it. You know, really hate speech. We really need to get it. You, look, the Europeans are doing it, and this is the way it should be. So we're really seeing the beginnings of an intellectual attack at the very highest level of our universities against the concept, the political concept of free speech. Now, that battle's been lost already in Europe. We're going to be fighting it for, 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 for years and decades here in the United States. And the assault is, is here, and it's going to intensify. Yeah. It's the gov government's job to uh, protect us from these attacks on, on our freedom. And uh, you say they should be doing that. But they've picked up that mantle and created the security state where you can't get on the airplane without being frisked, and they watch everything you do. Uh, to the extreme. Yes, so what the government is doing is not protecting us. It's supervising us, it's observing us, it's inspecting us, it's frisking us, it's listening to us. It's not protecting us. None of that has anything to do with protection, right? If they were just listening to people who might be terrorists or might engage in violent activity, that would be fine. But no, they're listening to all of us, they're storing our information, they're tracking it all. This is the opposite of defending us or protecting us. No, when I mean protecting, I mean finding the people responsible, the people who fund it, the people that ideologically support it, the people that provide the infrastructure for it, the people who send these bastards, and crushing them, destroying them, killing them, annihilating them, use any word you want, right? Bringing them to their knees so that nobody would ever have a, a thought of attacking the United States, of doing anything to the United States. There was a term during Iraq, shock and awe, but real shock and awe, not the pretend stuff that we, we practiced you know, during that campaign. So we have to destroy them. And until we destroy them, that's, that's protecting us, right? And that should have been done in 1989 when Solomon Rushdie was attacked, or in, actually it should have been done in 1979 when our embassy was invaded, right? And, and, and the, the longer we wait, the weaker we are, the more we, and you, you can't say that. I mean, I've called all kinds of names for saying this. You know, genocidal, you know, and Islamophobic, whatever, right? And by people on the right, people on the left, people in the middle, people everywhere. But the fact is, it's a war. They declared it. They started it. The only job of the American military is to end it quickly, decisively, with as little casualties to outside as possible. It's the only responsibility of our military. And when we don't do that, it's only going to get worse. So yes, the default is, let's live in a police state, right, where everything's monitored. And that's what they're doing. Right? That's, that's why the NSA and all this stuff is so horrific, because it's not protecting us. It's the, using the excuse of terrorism to impose statism on us, to control us more, to, to, to violate our rights more. We'll make. You are so eloquent, and I really don't have anything formed, so um, I feel quite awkward. But but I won't be silenced. Good. <laughs> and, 
And this really doesn't fit in at all. But when you were speaking of Israel and, and, and the Holocaust and the Jews, and I don't disagree with any of it, uh, but I would like to know how you could maybe put into this, uh, can't put it in the picture you've drawn so far, but um, how does the Balfour Declaration fit in <laughs> when we talk about bringing all the folks back to Israel then. And, and what are they, what is Israel, what is the whole point of, of uh, Lord Rothschild and, and Balfour in that such circumstance? How did that break up? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> and it's mainly history. Look, the, the, the Balfour Declaration was a deal cut. Right. Um, the British owed, um, I'm too old for this because I can't remember people's names anymore. Um, the first president of the state of Israel, who, who, was, who was in Britain. And it, basically, look. No, not Ben Gurion. He was the first prime minister. Anyway, the po let me try to get to the heart of what I think you're asking, although I'm not sure. It sounds conspiratorial, so I'm not sure. The, the point is this Jews in the early part of the 20th century in Europe realized something that sounded nuts at the time, but turned out to be unbelievably true. They realized that if they stayed in Europe, they would die. They would be murdered in mass. And the, and the, the person who really realized this was Theodor Herzl after the Dreyfus trial in France. He was a secular, assimilated Jew who didn't want to be Jewish. Right? He, was, he was completely assimilated. And he looked at Dreyfus, who was a, I don't know how much you know about Dreyfus, and I'm not going to give you a whole history lesson, but a, a French Jewish general or, or colonel, uh, a very senior French officer, being persecuted clearly for being Jewish, even though he's completely assimilated. And Herzl came to the conclusion, if this is what's happening in France in those days, the symbol of enlightenment, Europe was, Jews were going to be slaughtered. Anti-Semitism was always going to be around and they would be killed. And he said, what can we do to save ourselves? And he said the only thing to do is self-identify as a Jew and get all the Jews together and go find a place to live. And Herzl didn't care where. Uh, the British offered uh, the Jews Uganda. And there was a vote in the Zionist Congress. There was a vote. And Herzl voted for going to Uganda. He didn't care. He just wanted out of Europe because he understood what was going on. The Balfour Declaration was a negotiation where the Jews said, look, we're looking for a place of land where there are not a lot of people where we can inhabit. And by the way, our ancestral land is, is now called Palestine. We'd like to go there. So they kind of deal with the British. Now that you've taken it over from the Ottoman Empire, would you give us that land? The British said, sure. We'll bring a little bit of Western civilization, part of the colonial project, to the Middle East. Why not? And that's the Balfour Declaration. That's, that's what it is. Uh, the Jews then went, built something, and created something, and they created civilization where there was nothing. You should read Mark Twain sometime on the state of Palestine when he toured it. He's got a little book about his tours around that region of the world, and he has a, he has a whole section on Palestine. And there was, there was nothing there. Right? And the Jews built something. They created something. And that's the right that the Jews have to that piece of land. They built it. They created it. They, 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 they created a free country, a civilized country. And that's, that's what needs protecting. Not the Jewishness and not the holiness of the land, but the fact that these people built, created. It's theirs, property rights. I don't even know if I answered the question, but anyway, you got a taste of Middle East history. And I think this will be the last question. How does free, how does free speech um, work with profiling? So how do you, how do you, how do you keep free speech, but then profile people to make sure that you're getting the right people. Like you were talking about, um, you don't want to be searched and, and in the Air Force and looked at and all of that, uh, all of that. So you profile people. How does that work with free speech? Well, I mean, profiling is not a violation of your right. It doesn't restrict you from saying stuff. Profiling just says you have the characteristics in some way of a threat. These people threaten you look like these people. So we're going to ask you some questions. We're going to search you in an airport situation where it's legitimate, I think, to search for security. Right? 
You don't have to go to the airport. So we're going to use the facts of reality about the particular case in order to evaluate you. And I don't think that's a violation of free speech. I don't think it's a violation of any right. I mean, if I looked in the Middle Eastern, I would want to be profiled. Because then I'd know they won the game. My wife, who looks Middle Eastern, I, I remember after 9-11 once we were going through an airport, and these TSA engines took her aside, right, as we're going boarding the plane, they took her aside to do an extra search. And she said, oh, are you profiling? And I said, oh, no, no. And she said, oh, why? You should be. <laughs> you know? And it was like, I don't mind, right? I, I want to be safe. I, don't mind. I, I have nothing to hide. Search me. I understand why you're searching me and not those blonde 10-year-old little girls. They're probably not suicide bombers. If I look like a suicide bomb, you know, I have no problem with that. This is part of protecting my rights. It's part of protecting my life. I have no problem with that, right? And I think profiling, it, it, honest people wouldn't mind being profiled. Now, it could be taken out of proportion on nonviolent crimes, on stupid things where police stop people just because of the color of their skin and all kinds of stuff. So I'm not defending all practices of profiling. But if there's a murderer out on the loose and he happens to be green, it's absolutely legitimate to stop everybody who's green and say, hey, there's this murderer out on the loose. Let me make sure it's not you. And the green people should say, yes, please, because I don't want to be a victim of that green murderer. Right? So profiling, when done rationally, is completely appropriate and not a violation of anybody's rights. Okay. Great. Thank you all. <laughs>